Today I'm hosting Ronald Debert, professor of political science and the founder and director of Citizen Lab. We will talk about the most recent investigations on spyware, how we can control it, and how can illegal surveillance and spying on journalists or activists be exposed or prevented. Ronald Debert is professor of political science and the founder and director of the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. The Citizen Lab is focusing on research, development and legal engagement on digital technologies, human rights and global security. The Citizen Lab is known worldwide for its investigations on Pegasus spyware, which has been used by many states to hack the devices of world leaders, journalists, and civil society activists. As principal investigator, Ron has been a contributing author to more than 160 reports covering groundbreaking research on cyber espionage, commercial spyware, internet censorship, and human rights. In recognition of his work and that of the Citizen Lab, Ron has been awarded multiple times. Among others, he was appointed Officer of the Order of Canada, which is the second highest honor for merit in Canada. So, welcome to the Lighthouse podcast, Ron. Thank uh, you for having me. Whereas the use of illegal surveillance and spying is widespread in authoritarian regimes, ever since 9-11, democratic governments too have tried to suppress uh, freedom and human rights in the name of national security. The latest challenge to media freedom and human rights uh, comes from the European Council, which intervened in the draft of the European Media Freedom Act that would allow, if adopted in this form, the use of spyware against journalists on the grounds of protection of national security. So, uh, how do you comment on the latest events and do you think it would be legal to spy on journalists under some exceptional circumstances? Well, uh, thanks for the question. Obviously, I'm very alarmed and definitely against the idea that it should be legal for government security agencies to spy on journalists and in democracy. Uh, freedom of the press is a, an essential pillar of liberal democracy. And uh, we need to protect journalists to be able to do their job because what they're doing benefits all of society. What they're doing is in the public interest. Of course, governments have spied on journalists as long as there has been journalism and newspapers. It's nothing new. What is most shocking about this uh, legislation is that it's a very cynical attempt to legalize what has effectively been going on for decades anyway. And that's just something that shouldn't be allowed to happen in my view, especially after the European Parliament just completed an inquiry into the abuse of spyware in Europe, which showed that uh, many countries in Europe, uh, Spain, Hungary, Poland, Greece, have used spyware to eavesdrop on many members of civil society, including journalists. Uh, obviously, this is something that we shouldn't have happening in a liberal democracy. So I, I, I hope it doesn't, uh, it's not completed and it's, it's something that uh, we can work to restrict. Mm. Yeah, we hope to. Uh, the Citizen Lab uh, has published reports on the use of Pegasus and Cytrox Predator in many countries. Um, uh, so before uh, we go into examples of its use, could you please explain to our listeners how these spywares work and what can they do once installed on someone's device? And what can they do even initially to prevent uh, getting the spyware on their devices? Sure. So the way to think about spyware is that it is an evolution of hacking technology. So going back 20 years or so, uh, the principal way that governments undertook this type of spying was to hack into people's computers. And typically what they would do would be to send an email with an attachment trying to trick a user 
a recipient into opening that attachment. And within the attachment would be some kind of malicious software that would take advantage of a software flaw in the operating system of the computer uh, that would enable the operators to silently take over that computer. Over time, the technology has evolved. It's become very, very sophisticated and targeting not just computers, but people's mobile phones. So everyone today carries around with them a mobile phone. It's always connected. You have one in your vest pocket, I see. Uh, these are typically always on. Uh, they're highly revealing about a person's uh, pattern of life, who they communicate with, um, what pictures they are taking, uh, where they are traveling. Every phone has an, a GPS embedded in it. Um, so they're very useful for tracking. So um, as people have started to adopt mobile technologies as part of their day-to-day -day life, naturally security agencies have wanted to get inside those devices. And there are companies that have offered services to enable them to do it. So NSO Group, which is probably the most infamous of the spyware companies, it manufactures Pegasus spyware, has put a lot of effort into designing the most stealthy, most sophisticated spyware. The latest versions of Pegasus can take over a device uh, that is vulnerable to exploitation without any interaction with the target. In other words, there's no, uh, there's, there's no need to trick uh, anyone into clicking on a link or an SMS message. Uh, instead, they can fire an exploit at a phone uh, taking advantage of some software vulnerability and then silently take over that phone. Once they have done so, um, they can read any email, even those that are encrypted. They can intercept text messages and chat messages, even those that are sent on very secure end-to-end -end encrypted messaging applications like WhatsApp or Signal. Uh, in a very scary way, they can turn on the camera and the microphone in other words, turning that uh, mobile device into a silent wiretap. So these are very powerful, almost godlike capabilities. Um, what they do is they take advantage of software flaws that even the vendors, say Google or Apple, are unaware of. These are known in the industry as zero days. They are exploits that the manufacturers of the operating systems are not yet aware of. And this means that there's almost no defense against them. If you happen to have a device that's not updated and NSO Group is aware of some flaw, there's really little that you can do if you are a target. Fortunately, uh, the technology is expensive. It's usually licensed to government operators on a, on a per target basis. So you have to pay more in order to target a lot of people. Um, even though governments have a lot of money, that restricts to some extent who may be victimized by this type of spyware. So usually they go after high profile value added targets. Um, in terms of defending yourself, well really, as I say, there's nothing that can be done uh, on, from the perspective of a user other than updating your phone software as quickly as you can. And maybe, believe it or not, turning it off and on. Uh, because sometimes the spyware can't persist through uh, a device reboot. But beyond that, there's very little that you can do to protect yeah. yourself. Something that very few of us do, actually, turning it off and on, but it's a good, good practice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but Ron, so far, uh, not a single case study of spyware victims uh, has been recorded in Serbia. Although we have uh, plenty of instances where civil society organizations or investigative journalists thought they were victims of some form of illegal interception because we had uh, examples where critical uh, drafts of non-published uh, articles were quoted by government ministers, even they never appeared in, uh, in the press actually, or uh, mentioned in pro-regime tabloid press, even though they were never published, and so on and so forth. So um, how do we actually know and can we know 
how to expose this illicit surveillance and prevent the violation of human rights and the right to privacy? Yeah, that's a very good question. First of all, I would answer it by saying that the spyware of the sort that we're talking about is only one tool in the toolkit of government surveillance. So there are many ways that you can gather surveillance, including planting a bug in the room in which you're located or uh, hacking your computer through other means or tracking your location using other types of uh, uh, surveillance technology. Uh, spyware is just one. It happens to be a most very potent tool of surveillance, but it's not the only one. So what's happening in Serbia could very well be the result of other types of surveillance systems being used. Or it could be the case that people just haven't discovered it yet. It is uh, a fact that the spyware is designed to be very stealthy, to evade detection. So the companies put a lot of effort into hiding what they're doing on behalf of their government operators. Even a group like us, which has you know, many decades of experience in forensic analysis, might not always be able to uh, uh, analyze and, and show convincingly that a person's device was hacked with this or that spyware. Um, there are different levels of confidence. One thing that's happening right now that might be of interest to your listeners, especially journalists who might be uh, targeted, is that Apple has started to do notifications sending uh, notices to people that they know based on their visibility into their own infrastructure who have been targeted with spyware. And many people around the world are getting these notifications. Some of them are coming to groups like us at the Citizen Lab or to our partners at Amnesty International or Access Now. If you do receive one of these notifications from Apple, that's a very good indication that your phone has been hacked with some kind of spyware. So I would just say if any of your listeners receive something like that, they should reach out to a group like Access Now for further assistance. Okay, well, we'll make sure that uh, they do that. They will listen to the show for sure. So um, and maybe not now that we are in the context of, of this horrible war in Ukraine, uh, there is another war that went a little bit sometimes, you know, beyond the radar, but uh, you uh, worked on it. So I wanted to ask you, what did Citizen Lab and Access Now investigation on Pegasus spyware show in the context of the Azerbaijan-Armenia war? <laughs> So this case uh, that we published together on is exactly is an example of exactly what I just described, in fact. People in Armenia started receiving Apple notifications saying that their devices had been targeted, so they went to Access Now asking for assistance, and then Access Now referred some of those people to us and some to Amnesty International. Together we did forensic analysis of... Um, of those devices uh, crash logs, and we were able to verify that many people had been hacked at, at specific times. Um, the reality is that on the forensic analysis side, you can often pinpoint down to the second when someone's device was hacked with Pegasus or other spyware. And that's what we did in this case. Uh, what we weren't able to say is who did it. Uh, there is a lot of circumstantial evidence in this case pointing to Azerbaijan because there is an armed conflict. Um, Azerbaijan, it is known as a customer of NSO Group, so it's quite likely it is some Azerbaijani government operator targeting people in Armenia. But it also wouldn't be out of the question for it to be some other government or even Armenia itself investigating uh, journalists through this type of surveillance technology. Um, it, the, the use of this type of spyware in an armed conflict is not surprising to us. Even though companies like NSO Group say that they sell this technology to governments so that it can be used for uh, narrow purposes, investigating crime, investigating terrorism, the fact of the matter is that they often use it to spy on each other 
and it's often used in armed conflict situations. However, this was the first time that we've ever documented something like that. Mm. But maybe um, something on what can elucidate who actually uses it could be the question that I want to ask you now is because the representatives of the NSO group said that the company sells its product directly to government agencies that we know. But however, there are also a multitude of non-state actors acting as intermediaries in these businesses. And uh, That's right. who are these middlemen in the business of selling spyware? Yeah, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked it because many people have a, a simplistic conception of how this works. The way to think about it is like a, a large, complicated supply chain. So companies like NSO Group, they often um, uh, are embedded in uh, several ownership groups. There are clusters of firms that um, typically are involved in various aspects of ownership, uh, private equity funds, many of them based in other jurisdictions. Some companies also set up subsidiary ventures in certain jurisdictions to take advantage of tax laws, to avoid export controls. And then it's very common for companies like NSO Group to have one or more middlemen or front companies that are set up within a jurisdiction where they want to do a sale that will act as a broker. So in other words, NSO Group itself may not contract directly with a government spy agency. There may be one or more companies that stand in the middle. This is um, useful to avoid uh, oversight and accountability. It becomes foggy if you're looking at this from the outside, trying to figure out which contract is for what purpose and who is responsible for it. It's a way to evade detection, in other words, and muddy the waters around who is responsible. In some circumstances, I'll just say Mexico, to right. give you I one example. An example, right, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a horrible situation, actually, because um, some of the people that were involved in brokering NSO Group's very first sales to any country in the world were in Mexico back in 2010, 2011. Um, involved people, very dubious people with connections to the drug cartels. Um, so you can have some um, really uh, concerning aspects of this type of sale when you're dealing with very sophisticated surveillance technology that can be widely abused combined with front companies made up of people with very dubious checkered pasts and maybe connections to even the criminal underworld. It's a recipe for abuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and what about the Canadian and US experience concerning spyware? Um, uh, what is generally the scope of the surveillance? Um, who are the actors and who are the targets? Well, uh, Canada, the United States, other advanced industrialized countries have uh, probably the most sophisticated surveillance capabilities in the world, uh, known as the Five Eyes. Uh, the signals intelligence agencies have collaborated with each other, cooperated with each other for many, many decades, going back prior to World War II. And of course, they have a lot of resources, big, big budgets that they can put towards the development of surveillance technology. So they are world leaders in this area. Um, recently, there was a disclosure made by the Canadian uh, uh, police, the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mountain of Police, that for many, many years they used spyware. They called it on-device interception technology um, without any public accountability. In other words, they didn't admit they were doing it. Uh, there wasn't proper oversight around it. I think that's a big problem because if you have that sort of thing going on in secret in democratic societies, then it's um, highly unlikely you'll be able to persuade authoritarian governments or governments that are democratically flawed that they should do something more responsible. Uh, you have to uh, 
you know, uh, practice what you preach is, is the way I would put it. And I think uh, in Canada and the United States, although we have pretty robust oversight in the United States, in Canada, that's actually not so good. It may surprise some of your listeners. To Look, it indeed. Uh, but, but maybe connected to that, because uh, if we know that even democratic governments uh, uh, are whites, it's you, their use of spyware is widespread. Uh, is it at all enough, as some would suggest, to uh, blacklist companies such as the NSO group to prevent surveillance on, or more needs to be done in this respect? Well, I think that uh, when we start asking ourselves how we address this problem, the first thing I think we need to agree on is there's not one single solution. Uh, blacklisting companies, as you put it, um, which the U.S. Commerce Department did recently with respect to NSO Group, Kandiru, and some other hack-for-hire firms, is one tool. I would say, and it's a very powerful tool. It's not going to solve the problem, but what it does do is make life very difficult for those businesses. Um, NSO Group has taken a big hit. It's really hurt its bottom line as a result of being put on this Commerce Department designated entity list. It also hurts their investors. So the big private equity funds that invest in these companies start thinking that maybe this is not such a good investment. And the hope is that this will lead to more responsible behavior on the part of the companies and their investors. It won't solve the problem as a whole. But if more countries did something like this and align themselves together in a common front, I think it would make life very, very difficult for NSO Group and other companies like them. But as you pointed out in your very first question, the picture is very mixed. We have... Uh, in Europe, uh, the European Parliament coming out strongly advocating for controls, even a ban on spyware, but then the, the European Commission talking about uh, enabling governments to spy on journalists. Uh, so it's, it's um, a very mixed picture but right maybe, now. Then maybe um, as a final question or a set of questions, uh, I would like to ask you about the control of spyware. Uh, uh, once you said uh, that spyware is what uh, nuclear weapons are to uh, conventional weapons, meaning that digital surveillance technology is much, much more sophisticated and powerful than wiretapping, for example. And this you already uh, explained very uh, eloquently how. Uh, but uh, then knowing this, uh, uh, how can we control spyware? And... Uh, in, in, because this links up to my previous question, really. Is it the good and only effective way to control it, to impose strict controls over its trade, for example? Should we maybe impose, I don't know, strict controls or trade of spyware as we do in arms trade industry, for example? Uh, the short answer is yes. I believe that uh, there are a variety of measures that we can take to prevent abuse, to control uh, the proliferation of this technology. Some of that should involve export controls. Uh, right now, unfortunately, um, the Israeli Ministry of Defense uh, gives licenses to Israeli-based companies. And although they have recently been more strict in how they approve those licenses, they're still uh, quite proactively supporting the industry as a whole. And I think we need to um, start there by convincing the Israeli public maybe, and other countries as well, because it's not just Israel uh, where these companies are based, that they have a, a, a responsibility uh, to ensure that technology which is being exported out of their countries is not being abused or facilitating various types of repression. Um, we also need to think about measures like arms control, as you say. Um, you know, the blacklist that we talked about earlier, the designated entity list, if many more countries did that sort of thing, it would create rules around the marketplace. But basically, I think the most important 
thing we can do is ensure that there is proper oversight. So in most countries around the world, security agencies still operate in a kind of Cold War setup. In other words, they're very secretive. Few people know what they're doing. Of course, there are good reasons for secrecy, uh, for intelligence agencies, for security agencies. They're investigating various serious threats to public safety uh, that, that are designed to protect us. Uh, I don't want to get on a plane where terrorists are going to blow it up, so I'm grateful that there are security agencies. But there's no reason why they can't do their job and have independent oversight as well to make sure that they're not stepping outside of their lanes and doing things that are inappropriate, like spying on journalists. The only way we can prevent that from happening is by creating and empowering independent oversight bodies to watch what government security agencies are doing. Well, th thank you very much, Ron, for your time. This has been extremely interesting, and I just invite all our listeners to check out uh, your recent publications that we will definitely uh, share with the publication of our podcast. And thank you very much once again for being our guest. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to speak with you. Mm -hmm.